Hello everyone, welcome to the Horror Realm. I'm Travis Bruce and today we're doing another Indie Horror Spotlight. Today I have with us, he's the executive producer and he's also an actor in an upcoming movie that is called The Seductress from Hell. I have with us today, Raj Jawa. Raj, welcome to the Horror Realm. Thanks Travis, thanks very much for having me. It's a pleasure, man. So tell us a little bit about The Seductress from Hell. Sure. It's a movie about a young woman who is really experiencing uh, a lot of hardship. You could say pushed beyond her breaking point uh, by both her psychopathic husband and the demands of both Hollywood and Los Angeles in general. That's very interesting because I, I mean, I hear, you know, I live on the East Coast. But I hear, you know, living in Southern California, like especially Los Angeles, the, the pressure to maintain and, and this, you know, to keep up with the Joneses is insane. Absolutely. I mean, it's kind of, uh, you know, a microcosm of what we think of Hollywood in general. It's very uh, nepotistic. It's kind of a, a small, small um, collection of people. It's a, it's an in-group. Um, so it's hard to break through. And I think Los Angeles kind of exhibits a lot of the same uh, issues of Hollywood, uh, for better or worse. Maybe it's because it's the home of Hollywood uh, or maybe it's its own uh, issues, but uh, but yeah, certainly Hollywood, uh, Hollywood, and Los Angeles in general certainly suffer. I'd say from a lot of maybe dehumanizing attitudes. Now, what drew you into this story and this project? Um, for similar reasons, actually, I, I tend to draw. I tend to be drawn towards uh, films that are. Uh, very exposing of the kind of dark side of humanity, um, the dark side of capitalism, the dark side of people. Uh, this is really what I like to show. And, and my favorite films tend to be ones that gravitate in this direction. I mean, nothing wrong with just pure um, mindless entertainment. I'm sure I have yeah. many films that I enjoy of that type as well. Uh, but when I, when I think of making movies, uh, I tend to really like the, the movies and, and want to make the movies that... Uh, kind of show the things maybe people hide from or try not to talk about in society um because I'm a, I'm a firm believer that it is it is discussing these things that that help uh exercise them or bring them uh to light or, or cause them to hopefully get cured eventually now you are serving double duty in the, in, the, in, the, in this film you are not only the executive producer but you're also acting in it what is that like? I mean, I can imagine that's a little stressful. It can be. It can be. I mean, thankfully, I had a very good team. Everyone, everyone on this film was was tremendous. So I'm not. Uh, I'm thankfully didn't feel too stressed or or worried about uh, the pr the production, as it were. Um, I'd say the the biggest stress is as an actor because you really just want to be. Uh, ready, prepared. You want to not, you know, basically look like an idiot. You want to know your lines and and be be prepared to work. You know, and I think that's where I feel most anxious, uh, more so than producing. Now, now, does it help by being an actor? Does it help with being a producer and working on the other side of the camera? Um. I would only say, I mean, I guess the only real answer I could think of is it helps in the sense of it's really hard to break in these days. And maybe it always has been. But, like, I think as an actor, I think more and more of us are looking for ways to, you know, one, keep working, but also raise our profile. And I think that's... Um, kind of a main mission of why I produce uh, films is I really enjoy acting. I'd like to do it more often, um, but without the opportunity to do so, I kind of need to produce my own work or, or find work to produce uh, of other of other directors and writers. So I was happy to work with Andrew on this one to uh, make that happen. And, you know, hopefully it'll go well and, and we'll do more in the future. Love it. Now, now, now you guys are going on the film festival um, circuit right now. That's, you know, and I can imagine as a filmmaker, that is a that is a little nerve wracking. That's a little stressful as well because you know you got to worry about you know am, are we going to get selected? Um, you know, are we going to win? How how are people going to people's reception of the movie is going to be? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, there is a lot of factors. I mean, we've 
uh, reached out to some uh, critics to get some reviews. So we do have the benefit of uh, having heard some uh, feedback in that sense, which has been great. Um, but yeah, really going to the festival, seeing if you get an opportunity to, you know, make a sale, connect with the audience, whatever, whatever's possible. Um, even getting accepted is really just uh, a treat in many places. Be having, getting to be able to put that uh, official selection laurel can be uh, its own reward. Um, so yeah, I'm really looking forward to uh, to whatever it re whatever it yields because it's basically just starting for us. So hopefully it'll um, there'll be many more to come. Now, as a filmmaker, as any horror filmmaker, what what would you say? Th what are three things that you would say that? mistakes that new indie horror filmmakers make all the time? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I mean, not following the, the, I, I don't, I hesitate to say trends, but like the audience perception or where the, uh, where the films are going these days. I think that's very important. I, I think if we look at old horror films, uh, they have a much different, like similar to old movies, they have a much different style, different style of acting even, um, that doesn't really translate as well today. Those movies can still be enjoyed um, for what they are, but they may not hold up in the same light or with, with new audiences, with Gen Z, as it were, um, may not find the value of them. Um, I think that's one really important lesson. And maybe from that is uh, adapting. Taking, taking maybe old stories and adapting them to new situations, I think, can be very helpful um, to new horror filmmakers, especially because it is such a, uh, it's a rich, rich um, field and, and area. And so much has been done from, you know, zombies and vampires to like more um, just internal mental pieces that, uh, yeah, it's really a, a, you know, I think horror has a tendency to, um, this may be the third issue is I think people have a tendency to pigeonhole or box horror into one genre. And I think some of the best horror films, or at least some of my favorites, certainly blend multiple genres. So I would think that is a very important lesson as well is don't, don't maybe go for a straight, like this is just a horror film. It's like, have some, uh, have some uh, substance or meaning behind it perhaps. And I totally agree with you. Like, like, you know, when it comes to some of my my favorite horror films, they have yeah, they're horror, but they have some action uh, elements in it. Or they even have the horror comedies. Like I like when you know two genres mix up, and you know you have this fucking masterpiece that's bouncing off of two different genres. I agree. I agree. Like some of my favorites uh, that I can think of right now are like Happy Death Day, which uh, mixes that that horror and comedy element, um, and then the, like Vivarium, which is uh, you know that um, uh, movie about uh, home ownership and kind of mm -hmm. touches on a little bit of capitalism, a little bit of uh, society. It's these are these are horror films where I find they're very interesting. They may not be like strict horror, uh, as it were, but they certainly. Um, touch on those elements in a way that is very interesting and very uh, meaningful, I would say. Now, and, and you brought on something interesting, like horror, the horror genre goes in waves, right? And, you know, I, I, I said all the time, you know, in the 80s, we, did, there were, we went through the slasher phase, and then we went, and from there we went into the scream phase, and then we went into the, the, the found footage Blair Witch phase. It goes through phases. Now, and and I guess as a as, as a filmmaker, it's good to know what's hot and make moves on it. But at a certain point, you know, you start getting what I call urban legends when it comes to <laughs> when it comes to Scream. We start getting these movies issues over and over again as Scream repeats. As a filmmaker, is it is it important to know when a a subgenre or phase is about to end? I mean, certainly I would say uh, intuitively, yes. I think the only, uh, the only like caveat or the only like exception is when it, it I mean, it's, it's random. Like you don't know when it's going to be an exception. Yeah. <laughs> so I do think, I do think there's value in if you have a vision to make something that maybe doesn't it seem out of its time. Um, <clears throat> maybe you do go ahead with it because, you know, maybe nobody else sees it right now, but 
once it's once it's put to screen, um, it is what it you know it's it is what everybody wanted. I think there's probably plenty of movies, um, horror and outside of horror, uh, that existed like that where people didn't really have an idea of what it's supposed to be and like don't make this and then it gets made and like ah oh, this is this is incredible. Um, so I think it's really really it's it's following your heart. Certainly trends and numbers and analytics it all comes into play for sure. And I and I definitely will uphold the value of all those things as well. But I think just following your heart at the end of the day is what we do as filmmakers. And it is where most of our success lies. We may take some punches, but at the end of the day, we have to follow our heart and our passion. Now, as a filmmaker, when you think about your target audience, are you gearing t more towards the hardcore horror fans or, or are you also thinking about the casual horror fans? You know, the people who like, who dabble in a horror every once in a while. Yeah, I mean, I think with this film, it's looking more on the casual horror fan. Like, I certainly hope uh, serious horror fans would enjoy it as well. Um, but I think it's more on the casual uh, casual side in terms of, like, maybe it's uh, um, scare or fear elements. It's much more of a... Um, gore and thriller side of horror that I think uh, would connect with audiences and especially would connect with audiences that are, um, you know, maybe more dabbling in horror. Like, like I talk about is the, um, the genre bending or the, the adding of other genres into the horror. So I, I do think uh, there's definitely probably more for casual horror fans in, in my thought. Yeah. Because I mean, I, I say it all the time, you know, that, you know, the casual horror fans actually make up the, the the biggest population of the horror community, and those are the, the individuals. I mean, those are the individuals who purchase the purchase you know the tickets. Um, those are the ones who like they like horror every once in a while. You know, if it's a horror movie that grasps their attention, they will go out and see an Abigail, or they'll go out and see a Long Legs, or a Barbarian, or an X. So like and. Those are the individuals who are more likely to. I, I say they are seventy percent of horror fans. Sure, it makes a lot of sense, and it makes a lot of sense too because it, it it's definitely the horror uh, audience that I would say takes a greater risk or greater risk is not the right word, but greater chance on movies that are untried, untested, um, not you know not from directors that have been uh, been uh, in mainstream Hollywood and you know not always mainstream actors. So I think there is a uh, a willingness in horror audiences, and maybe it is the casual horror audiences to um, give things a shot. And I think that's one of the most appealing things about the genre um, as a producer anyways. And what's one thing that you're absolutely nervous or terrified about the future of indie horror or horror in general? I mean, I think it's kind of the same fear I have for indie that it just won't uh, won't live. You know, it, it continues to live um, today, um, and I'm sure people have called for its its demise in the past and like thought it wasn't going to continue. Um, so it's very likely it will continue. But I think I always worry that. Um, you know, you just never know uh, if you get completely crowded out or drowned out by the mainstream with their, you know, advertising budgets and everything else they can do. Um, I think there's a a big risk for indie films to just not be seen anymore in general, whether it be horror or not. I think um, we rely on the audience's desire and willingness to continue to try it because I think there are other um areas where people are less willing to try uh a non-name brand as it were you know people are mm -hmm. not going for the generics and i think you can in a way call indies the generics of film and it's keeping that audiences um engaged in that in and not letting them fall completely to the wayside of uh of mainstream hollywood because you know nothing wrong with mainstream hollywood but it certainly um i think lacks a lot of the heart and soul that indie pictures have. And one thing I'm glad about, so, so I'm, I've always been an indie horror fan. I grew up in 80s, so like I, I'm from the, from the VHS full moon days. And one thing that I am fucking excited about right now is a lot 
more indie horror movies are getting theatrical releases. Even their small theatrical release, but they're 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 getting a chance to be seen the way that movies should be seen. For sure, for sure, I agree with that, uh, and that's that's definitely uh, something I, I do see on the audience side, and I think on the the uh, distributor producer side, there is an advantage to this um, theatrical release because I think more and more people are saying that uh, streaming just isn't cutting it. Whether they're um, not providing you the revenue, the the revenue numbers are just too low. Um, I think really physical media and, and you, we can count theaters in physical media in that way um, is having its, its kind of heyday in terms of, of, you know, audience enjoyment, but also the ways in which uh, films can actually make their money back um, in a, in a more viable way. It's surprising because it's a lot more work, a lot more, um, you know, handshake agreements and trying, you know, going to the theaters um, in person and saying like, Hey, can we play this for a few weeks or whatever? And they're like, Oh, how about a few days? And like, okay. Um, you know, and I think that is where the a lot of the future money or a lot of the bigger money in the indie films will be made or a lot of the you know budgets made back um which is great i mean that's how if the budget's not made back the film can't you know we can't make more so i think these new venues are, are not that they're they're actually old venues but these venues in which uh these these uh new ideas of distribution i think um are really helping indies stay stay alive and stay afloat in the um, kind of consolidated future we have. Yeah, because because I mean I talk to a lot of indie filmmakers and they say that it is absolutely hard to make money on streaming. It's absolutely hard, and you know it's it's the theatrical releases. It is the the um, hard copy DVD sales are like you know that's where you're going to attempt to make your, your budget back absolutely no it's definitely it's definitely that's that's definitely part of our plan as well so we're we have uh we have set in motion to to go forward with that once we're once we're done with the festivals or maybe in between or whatever we'll see how that goes awesome all right raj as you know this is a horror channel so i'm gonna ask you three random horror questions personal opinion okay by the way. Hmm. all right all right the first one what is one horror movie that most people don't know about that that they should know about mm. um i think uh i did have to i did have to do some research on what i watched in recent before i did this but okay. i will say i think uh i think uh, escape from tomorrow would be one that i really enjoyed the uh uh the film that was shot uh probably not recommended, but shot illegally at Disneyland and Disney World, um, kind oh, of guerrilla yeah. style. Yeah, um, I thought it was very interesting, very um, very human. Like, I, again, I don't know if it fits that strict horror genre. It's probably more thriller, more, um, more on that end of thing. But I certainly did enjoy um, that, even just for the even for just the, the guerrilla style of it. And the, um, I have a tendency to really... Uh, I don't know, empathize or really enjoy other filmmakers, kind of feel their work as I'm watching the movie. So that's one where I really felt like, oh yeah, I feel like I'm here on set with them, like doing this. I feel like I, I know what's going on and it's really, it's really exciting. It's really, um, really fun to, to kind of feel that and see that. All right. So now I got to check that one out. Um, yeah. Mine is definitely Mandy. Mandy with Nicholas Cage. Mm -hmm. and, and sure. like, uh, now, now, hardcore horror fans know about it. I, but the, I feel like the casuals were, uh, don't, and like Mandy is definitely one of those horror movies that is. It's just a beautiful fucking psychological trip horror movie. It it really is. That sounds great. Yeah, I haven't seen that one, but I have definitely seen uh, promotions for it. So I definitely want to check that one out. Great one, great one. Second one, who who is on when it comes to your Mount Rushmore of horror villains? Who would you put on your Mount Rushmore? Oh, I mean, Michael, Michael Myers is definitely probably up there. Um, yeah, I mean, he definitely, for me, uh, even having not watched his movies, I, I think I've, I've seen them plenty of times. Um, but it was the classic, like, 
TV syndication. So it's just on, mm -hmm. um, you know, different. I don't even know which Halloween movie this is. He's standing there <laughs> looking all menacingly, but uh, I've definitely seen him. But I, I put him on there because uh, how many uh, years or decades um, living kind of in fear of that kind of uh, presence as, as he brings to that, uh, that character. Um, I would say uh, maybe an odd one, but uh, I put the uh, grudge on there um, just because I don't know which one, the, the, the woman or the son, but uh, yeah, it's um, that one is another one where it really, Really, I mean, it's been definitely a jump scare movie, but it definitely got me for a while. Definitely had a lot of times where I didn't want to, like, you know, not, you know, be in the bathroom with the shower uh, curtain open or whatever. Um, you know, it's a weird one for Mount Rushmore, but I'd put the thing up there. You know, that's a that's a more recent watch for me. And I was I was very blown away with how much I enjoyed it. I was I um, another one where it's maybe not the most um, prominent aspect of the movie, maybe not for all audiences, but really the the breakdown of humanity and the breakdown of trust between people um, is so so well on display in that movie. Fourth one, uh, I think I honestly I might put the Happy Death Day mask on there because it is so iconic. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I really, really attack and it really kind of symbolizes the kind of horror comedy for me. Mm -hmm. Those are some good ones. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Like yeah. Some new ones too. Uh, all right. Final question. Okay. What is one horror movie that everybody says that they love and you're like, I don't see it. Hmm. Ooh, that is a hard one. Uh, I guess it would be probably Dawn of the Dead, I think. And that's probably controversial. But, like, yeah, I think that one's just one where I'm, I'm just a little less in touch with it, or a little less connected with the what's going on in the movie, that it just doesn't, uh, it just doesn't click for me. The original or the reboot? Uh, the original. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna say something very controversial. I actually Please. think the reboot is is better than the original. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, maybe that could be true. I haven't seen the reboot, so I'll have to check that out because because maybe that is the one I should be watching as well. Because I mean, I mean, like, and there's only there's only two reboots that I feel that way about. Where like, mm. wow, the reboot is better than the original, and like I. I feel like people give me a weird fucking look like, is this motherfucker really a horror fan <laughs> when I say that? And that's one, and the other one is Friday the 13th. I love the Friday the 13th reboot. I, I, sure. I find it more entertaining than any of the other ones, <laughs> by far. And like, and I know I get weird looks at that one, like, because <laughs> Friday the 13th fans hate that fucking movie. But like, I just thought it had a better character development, better, I mean, more interesting characters, Jason, I mean, himself was was more. He was. It, it gave a backstory to Jason. Like, where the fuck was this motherfucker living? Where does he live? What does he do? How the hell does he jump in front of these people so fast? And this and that. Tunnels. You know what I mean? Like, makes sense. Like, yeah. Did something different. All right, sure. Rod. Yeah. Where can everyone find you on social media? Um, I keep it simple. I'm at uh, rajjawa.com. You can all get me at raj.biz. It goes to the same place. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. I'm on YouTube. Uh, I do video game streaming. I, I, I have a little bit of everything. I'm on all channels. If you Google me, you'll, you'll probably find me um, pretty easily. Um, yeah, I, I'm pretty much everywhere. Awesome. Raj, listen, this has been a pleasure having you on, man. I can't wait to see the seductress from hell. Thanks. Thanks, Travis. Great beer. Everybody, listen. Make sure to go ahead over there and follow Raj and also to send your support and look out for the seductions from hell. Everybody, thank you for coming to the Horror Room. I'm Travis Bruce, and that's Raj Jawa. We'll see you next time. Take care.